Welcome, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. We have a fantastic episode coming up for you tonight. Richard Doherty joins us coming up next. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. I'm author and researcher Mike Ricksecker. With me, as always, is my co-hostess, Victoria Monday. And down in the chat room, Alina moderating the chat. We have a fantastic episode coming up for you tonight. Richard Doty joins us. He is a former Air Force OSI agent, counterintelligence. And this guy has been in the field for a long, long time. A very knowledgeable man. He's He's been the guy working behind the scenes. And uh, we're it's a real pleasure to have him with us this evening. Talk about Area 51. Met him for the first time here at the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference. So without further ado, Rick, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure to be here, Mike and Victoria. Yeah. I- oh, so nice to meet you finally. <laughs> it's, it's nice meeting you. So, Rick, let's talk a little bit about your background for just a moment for our, our viewers. Now, you were uh, Air Force o- Air Force OSI for uh, 10 years. Prior to that, though, however, you were actually uh, uh, regular duty Air Force. So there's a there's a difference between the two of that I think people don't necessarily realize. So can you kind of explain that uh, for us for just a moment? Yes, I, I was active duty United States Air Force for four years. I worked in intelligence, uh, went to language school, learned Russian, uh, worked uh, in Europe. And then I got out of the Air Force, went to college, uh, and then I came back in as a um, civilian special agent, uh, GS, came in as a GS-9, and worked my way up to a GS-11. Um, so I was a civilian special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And what I, what I connected, uh, or, or I, I, um, I talk about um, OSI being similar to uh, NCIS. People watch the NCIS show where these special agents were uh, civilians. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We had a we ha- had an electrical storm here. And apparently, oh, my hi. internet uh, blacked out for me. I mean, I have a high speed internet, but something happened. But anyway, I'm back. Does that mean it's coming this way then? Oh no. <laughs> it might be coming your way. Oh great! Yeah. Yay! I'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not sure where I cut out. Yeah, you, you cut out when you were relating to um, uh, AFOSI to, uh, CSI. to NCIS. Was it oh. CSI or yeah, NCIS? Yeah, NCIS, yeah. NCIS. It's similar to uh, uh, NCIS. OSI is similar to uh, NCIS. Uh, AFOSI is a criminal counterintelligence uh, investigative arm of the Air Force. I didn't work in the uh, criminal area. I worked strictly counterintelligence, and I did that from uh, – 1978 to 1988. Yeah, and my job wanna, uh, was you, counterintelligence or counter espionage. Good. Yeah, and, and I do want to talk a little bit about that uh, you know, within our conversation this evening. But um, before we get into all those uh, very interesting topics, one thing that you brought up during your presentation uh, at Laughlin this year that I, I think is another thing that people don't realize or quite understand is security clearances uh, just because you have a top secret security clearance doesn't mean you get you know free reign and access to everything uh, it's very very compartmentalized and i like the way that you explained that during your presentation can can you do that for us again real quickly here sure uh <clears throat> everyone with intelligence has a top secret cl- security clearance and uh, that top secret security clearance allows them to have access to information that uh, people wouldn't normally have. But within the intelligence uh, community, there's specially compartmented uh, information that is protected. And just because you have a top secret security clearance doesn't give you ha- access to everything there is regarding a particular program. You have to have access or need to know in order to gain access to a uh, particular program, a high level program, such as the UFO uh, phenomena within the the government. Uh, There's so many different layers of security within that, um, within the intelligence community regarding UFOs that uh, you might have access to part of the information, 
but you might not have access to all of it. It's strictly compartmented. All right, fantastic. I think that kind of helps us to set up the evening. And uh, real quick, down here, Nicole, Guiding Echoes, just want to show some extra love for Edge of the Rabbit Hole with the $2 Aww. Super Chat. So thank, thank you, you, Nicole. <laughs> uh, On that topic, you were... Right there. Oh, me? <laughs> oh, my. <Right. laughs> oh. I didn't know. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> On that topic you were just Good talking about, do you think um, not on the need to know um is that specifically because people just don't need to know or is it for security like in case anyone is i don't know, captured or whatever taken abducted whatever you want to call it um they won't have the whole pizza basically they only have a slice is it for a security reason too well if you're working in a war zone or behind enemy lines yes i'm sure that's going to be the case but uh the reason that one person doesn't get access to everything is because that person could uh, spill the beans, so to speak, and go, uh, rogue, go rogue, yeah, or or uh, possibly be captured, or uh, become a spy, and then uh, they 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 they'd give the whole uh, um, kitchen and refrigerator and right. everything else to the enemy. So that's why it's compartmented. And and another reason is. You don't ne necessarily need access if you're conducting some kind of an investigation or operation. Uh, when I was conducting operations regarding uh, UFOs, uh, I had access to what I needed to know. I didn't have access to everything. Uh, for instance, uh, I didn't have technical uh, knowledge of, of how a UFO operated or all the technical um, uh, things that a UFO can do or what we, uh, the United States government, gathered uh, technologically from a captured UFO. I, I, w I didn't have any information regarding that. Okay. All right. Cool. Now let's um, <laughs> let's go ahead and dive into to Area Fifty One here because you spent some time there. Of course, you know the the government. Uh, you know, kind of denied that Area 51 existed <laughs> during all that uh, that period of time, and you know, just recently revealed here. But, um, you know, what what exactly was your role there? What were you doing at this location? I was assigned to the uh, Air Force OSI office at Groom Lake. Uh, Groom Lake is what uh, the general public refers to as Area 51. Right. It was named Area 51 back in the 50s when the Nevada test site was uh, um, developed for nuclear above and, and below ground nuclear testing. And the uh, government acquired a large tract of land um, in, in that center, center section that encompassed Nye County and uh, part of, of, of Lincoln County in central Nevada. And they, they split it up in different areas. And in the area that Groom Lake is located, it's called Area 51. Uh, Tonopah uh, Test Range or Tonopah Air Force Base now is called Area 52. So there's uh, um, that's how Area 51 got its name. Um, my job out there was I was a counterintelligence officer. I initially went out there uh, on a t TDY basis or temporary duty basis, TDY. Uh, Mike knows what that is, but... Most well, public don't. <laughs> TDY means temporary duty, going from from one ba base to just on a temporary duty. The back in those days, in the, in the in the seventies, uh, Nellis uh, Indian Springs Air Force Base, uh, which is now Creech Air Force Base, and Groom Lake was part of Air Force OSI District Seventeen out of Kirtland Air Force Base. So uh, we would send agents on a temporary basis out there to fill in for other agents. And I actually, my first assignment out there in, in, in 1984 was to fill in for an agent who, who had been sick. So I went out there to fill in his spot and he was a counterintelligence officer. And that's, I took over uh, his position for, uh, for a, a period of time. And what I did was I ran uh, counterintelligence operations, uh, could, could involve, um, a UFO activity or a project that we're trying to protect. Um, and uh, that, that was my job. Okay. So 
as a counterintelligence agent, so you're spreading essentially spreading dif disinformation, correct? For the most part, uh, we did. Uh, we would investigate something first and uh, determine what course of action was necessary to protect a particular uh, high security project. And then we would uh, write reports, send them up to our headquarters, and most of the information pertaining to uh, UFOs went to DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency at Bowling Air Force Base. And then uh, we'd get information back uh, directing us what to do. Okay. And so, and so let's, let's say, so there would be a, a report of some sighting and you would go investigate and see what's going on with that, right? Initially, what we, what we did was we, my first, uh, several, I guess, pr probably three, I mean, three or four assignments dealt with people that worked on Area 51 okay. that uh, had uh, reported something to an outside agency or to a, uh, well, I'll give you, I'll give you an actual example of, a, of an operation. An Air Force captain who had high level security clearance and high level access to technical data that was being um, obtained from an ET craft that had crashed. Uh, and we had, we had it in captivity at Papoose in an area we call S2. And we'll talk about S2 later because um, I'll explain the difference between my S2 and Bob Lazar's S4. But anyways, ah, uh, we, 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 he, he gave out some information to a, a person uh, that didn't have a need to know, wasn't in the Air Force. We obtained uh, that uh, knowledge. We, we found out about it. And so my job there was to, number one, investigate him, the captain, find out why he gave the information he did. And then I had to investigate the person that he that received that information. And then that person was the one we had to disinform because that person was a civilian, had no access to anything in the military, didn't work for the military, didn't work for the government. And we had to convince that person uh, one way or another that what the captain told her was, uh, was erroneous or was uh, made up. Okay, can okay. I ask a question? Go ahead, Victoria, <laughs> uh, I know you're itching. <laughs> um, are, you, are you referring to Paul Benowitz or was this another captain? Oh, no, no, this was different. Yeah, okay. Paul Benowitz, no, this wasn't, Paul Benowitz's case was at, in Albuquerque. This, this case was out in Nevada. Gotcha. Um, because I was really curious about Benowitz, um, and I thought of a really nice way to ask it, and I forgot now. Um, you basically were tasked with reframing his um, his reality, so to speak, <laughs> through disinformation. Why him? Uh, did he have some sort of ranking, or was he a, a whistleblower, or why why him? Well, Paul Benowitz was a scientist. He he owned a okay. uh, his own business, Thunder Scientific Laboratory which was right outside Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, Paul Benowitz's company, Thunder Scientific, had a uh, classified uh, contract with the United States government. His company made um, sensors for submarines, uh, Trident submarines and other, other types of submarines. So Paul had a, a high level security clearance. His company had an industrial security clearance with the, with the government. Okay. Paul Benowitz also lived right close to Kirtland Air Force Base. In fact, he lived, his was backyard that? was on the perimeter of Kirtland Air Force Base. And Paul started and taking look, photographs. Right into it. Right? Yeah, yeah, he was elevated into it. Yeah. Exactly, he was elevated. You could look right into the base and right into a classified <laughs> area, Mon Monzano <laughs> storage area, which was the largest nuclear weapon storage area in the world. So he could look right into it from where he was at. He was okay. maybe a, a mile away from it. And so he started taking pictures of strange things that were occurring over the base. And eventually he then came to the base and told the chief of security police uh, what he had, he had obtained and what he saw. Uh, the chief of security police then referred him to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ernie Edwards, who was the commander of the um, 
the storage area where the nuclear weapons were. Okay. And then immediately after hearing Paul Blinowitz's story, Ernie got on the phone and called me. I was a counterintelligence officer at the base and gave me the story. He actually, he called me and he said, I need you to come to my office right away. It's something very important. So, and I had known Ernie for a while. And so I said, sure, and I'll, I'll be right there. So I took, took off and went, drove to, the, to the, his location. And then he told me about Paul Benowitz. Well, the, the red flag went up because what he was telling us, uh, what he told Ernie was that he was gathering pictures and electronic signals coming from a base, a particular high level security area on the base. And so that's how the Paul Benowitz started, the investigation gotcha. started. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a uh, $5 super chat here from the uh, chat room, Android Purity, and uh, has a question for you. Did you know what you were getting yourself into when starting the job? So when you when we took the, the uh, AFOSI job and uh, you ended up out there at, at Area 51 and some of, the, some of these other locations, did you know what you were getting yourself into with this? When I joined OSI, um, well, first of all, my my father was in intelligence. My father was an Air Force, uh, retired Air Force Colonel. And he was in intelligence. My uncle, uh, Edward Doty, was famous for the Lonnie Zamora case in Socorro. He investigated that. So I came from a family of, of uh, Air Force persons. And so, um, well, I knew to intelligence. I knew what, what I was getting myself into. But uh, I wasn't recruited into a UFO program. I was recruited into an intelligence program for, for the United States Air Force. And I had no uh, knowledge of uh, the government's involvement with UFOs when I joined OSI. Now, there are some people out there. I know Phil Class claimed, of course, he passed away. But Phil Class and some other people claimed that during my time in the regular Air Force, I was doing the same thing. And I had been briefed into a program. And so that didn't happen. I, I was never briefed in any UFO programs when I was in the regular Air Force. That just, that's, that's not true. So uh, when I joined OSI, I didn't know anything about UFOs or, or we investigated UFOs. I went to uh, uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Academy and then went to an OSI uh, uh, school. Then I went to a DIA school and then I went to a, a CIA course. And none of those courses mentioned the subject of UFOs. <laughs> they never ever mentioned that we would be investigating them or anything like that. Now, they told us that we would be investigating high level security projects. We would be protecting high level uh, uh, programs, high level secure, security uh, clearance programs. But I didn't know anything about UFOs and our, our the government's involvement with UFOs until I was briefed into the program after I joined OSI. Have you ever seen also, a UFO? Uh, I saw him flying, I saw him on the ground at <laughs> Area 51. So yes. <laughs> yes. So you actually okay. did see them at Area 51. Um, just and, and thank you, Android Purity, for the uh, five dollar super chat. We do appreciate that. Um, so Betty Lange kind of followed up with that. Actually, I think she asked this before he did. Uh, did you? Did you believe in UFOs to begin with? So it, before you even you know briefed into it, uh, and before you even went out to Area Fifty One, did did you previously have a belief in in UFOs? Absolutely not. I was not a believer. I I never delved into that growing up. Uh, my brother, um, he was the UFO buff. He would buy. We roomed together. He would buy the True magazines, the old True magazines. <laughs> Mm -hmm. about UFOs. Some of, some of the old timers can remember the true magazine. Hey, hey, who do you call an old timer? <laughs> <laughs> I, he, I he, also, he also bought a book. Uh, that I think it was the first book that George Adamski wrote. And one night he showed me the book. I read maybe a couple pages of it and I, I threw it back at it on his bunk. And I said, you know, that's that baloney. I, I didn't believe it. I, I wasn't ever interested in it. My interest back in those days was, um, I read everything Zane Gray ever wrote. I love Westerns. And that was my, my, my beliefs back in those days. I didn't believe in UFOs. And I have to tell you this, that when in 1979, when I was briefed into the program, because I had an investigation involving UFOs, which occurred at Kirtland Air Force Base, I was briefed into the program. 
I had to go to an Air Force Special Security office. I saw a film. I was briefed into the program. And, and the briefing uh, consisted of the United States government involvement with UFOs from 1947 on. And this is in 1979. So it's 30 some years, 32 years of US involvement. Now, after the briefing, I drove in my OSI vehicle from the west side of Kirtland Air Force Base over to the east side. And while uh, I was driving, I pulled off the side of the road and I sat in, my, in, the, in, in the vehicle and I contemplated what I had just heard. And it, it was somewhat of a shock to me. I mean, I thought, my God, this stuff is real. It was, it was kind of hard for me to believe it. I thought, well, is this kind of some kind of a psychological warfare, a psychological program they're putting us through? Because was, I wasn't the only one there. There were many other uh, uh, intelligence officers there. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll find out. And so when I, <laughs> when I started in this particular investigation I was doing at Kirtland, then I realized talking to other people that had been, that had been involved in this program for many, many years, I realized, yep, in fact, the government did know, the government has kept it secret, and now I know. So you mentioned earlier that you saw UFOs at Area 51, Groom Lake. What exactly did you see? Well, we would, um, myself and my partner out there, um, we would... Uh, drive around and, and we had missions to do. We had, we had uh, people to speak with. Uh, the base was quite large, so you had to drive around. And one particular night we drove to a really remote location on the base. Uh, it was actually down past Papoose Lake towards the Nevada test site, which is of course now the Nat Nevada National Security site. It was a, 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 a small complex down there that we had to go down and interview somebody and it was it was because of it of, of, of something relating to a um, the ET contact, and it was uh, somewhat uh, late at night when we were driving back, and as we were driving on the road, and there's several checkpoints between where we were and to the containment area of, of Area 51 where we actually had our our billets, um, we saw something flying, and this thing was doing. Um, maneuvers that I'd never seen an, air, an airplane do. It was flying in circles and it would stop. It would shoot up, uh, ascend to a certain point, stop, and then descend to almost the ground level. My partner and I drove over towards where this was and we, we sat there in our, our vehicle. We got, actually got out of the vehicle and stood outside and watched this thing for oh, probably 40, 45 minutes. And then eventually it landed back at Groom Lake. So we drove back to the base and, and, and we, again, it was about 30 minute drive from where we were at to the base. We got to the base, we drove down next to the flight line. Now, as I said earlier, I didn't have access to everything on the base. We did right. have access to some, some areas of the flight line, but, but I, we couldn't go out in the flight line and we couldn't go into to most of the hangars. We saw this thing on the ground and we saw it being moved into a hangar, a very large hangar. So uh, we went back to our billets, uh, went to bed next morning and went to the office. Um, my supervisor's last name was Hutchinson, unfortunately passed away some years ago. Hutch, we referred to him as Hutch. I went in and sat down at his desk and I said, hey, Hutch, um, we saw something flying last night. Uh, can you? And he was briefed into a lot more programs than, than hmm. when, I were, when I was. He said, I guess you saw one of our uh, toys that we're trying to uh, reverse engineer. And that's all he told us, oh, wow. told me. So I said, okay. So then I, over a period of time, slowly uh, gained access to two sides of what we were doing out there. Um, the recovered crafts that we had at S2, we were trying to fly. And then on the other side of the coin, we were trying to reverse engineer the recovered crafts. And a good example of this uh, was the Cash Landrum case of 1980. Uh, we had a, a, a large uh, UFO that we had recovered, and I don't know where we recovered it. We couldn't get the propulsion system to work. So we placed an experimental 
nuclear propulsion system on this craft and we flew it. And that was the one that was uh, involved in the Cash Landrum case. So that's an example of a reverse engineering, partly reverse engineering. Uh, we couldn't reverse engineer the, the, the uh, engine because we couldn't understand the, what the, how the propulsion system worked. Well, you mentioned and let me, Bob let me Lazar let, earlier. Right now, let me explain something else out there. Sure. Uh, this is somewhat of a, 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 a conundrum with some people. We had different flying crafts from different extraterrestrial races. They were all different. I mean, extremely different. I know one particular person uh, in the UFO community says, I can't understand why we can't get these crafts to work. You get the one to work, you can get the other to work. That doesn't work that way. If you, if you talk to Dr. Putoff um, and some of the other uh, scientists that ha knew and, and worked on these things, they can real you realize the science and the technology of these different crafts are entirely different. The propulsion is all from different races. Exactly. They're all from different races and they're all manufactured differently. And that's okay. why we had so much, uh, we have so much trouble then, and I'm sure we still have trouble now trying to reverse engineer. Was there one that was more, um, more sophisticated than the others? And did you know what uh, is races? Is that the correct? name to call it's not species races, races. okay et what races what yeah. demographic how about that what demographic it came from was there one that was more advanced than the other well i didn't have access to all the scientific data so i can't tell you that i don't i don't i know that we did get some of them to work the even crafts the crap the one that crashed in, in roswell um we recovered that we had assistance because we had a live et uh, that lived until 52 explaining how that his craft worked. But then again, uh, he can explain it to us, but he's not explaining it to us in our technology right. or our science. He doesn't know our science. He doesn't know our technology. He doesn't know our math, our trigonometry, our calculus. So he has to explain it in the best way he can to us, to our scientists. So uh, back in those days, our scientists basically had to go back to first grade and learn them, that ma that math. It was easier for EBA. That that's they called that that uh, ET uh, to learn our math because he was so educated. I mean, he was so uh, smart. And I think they estimated his IQ to be up in the two hundreds or three hundreds. Oh, wow. And so he could easily uh, grasp our math, our science, and but he had a problem of connecting our math with theirs and their technology. That's really the only, the only part of the technological aspect of this that I can, that I, that I knew. Okay. Now you had mentioned uh, Bob Lazar earlier. Now Bob was supposed to be working on reverse engineering those propulsion systems. How closely related was that, what he was working on to what you were witnessing there? Well, Bob was there after I left. Okay. Okay. Bob talks about S4. Now, if you look at Papoose Lake, you look at a map that George Knapp had, had put out, uh, the complex that pa Papoose Lake was S2. That's what it was called. The area that Bob Lazar worked was four levels under that, and that was called S4. The S2 or the top, top area that you entered was the administrative control center for whatever was underground. I, I never had access to anything underground. I had access to the control center or S2 complex. And S2 is where I went a number of times to conduct investigations, but I, I never visited nor did I have access to, to S4. And so Bob Lazar talks about S4. And uh, so he was t he's telling the truth. I believe everything Bob Lazar says the entry control procedures that I quizzed him on, he knew everything uh, about those. Uh, and of course, after I left, they developed some new uh, entry control procedures, the handprint, which we didn't have when I was there, but the exchange badge system, where the vehicle was parked when you entered S2, uh, the where the elevators were, 
I quizzed him on all those things, and he answered every single one of them correctly. So I'm convinced that that what Bob uh, Lazar said was, in fact, truthful. Is there? Yeah, an, uh, you know, I'm in. Uh, just a quick comment. I'll let you uh, ask the question here in a second, Victoria. And I just want to tell Rick real quick that no, I'm I'm also in the camp. I I believe Bob. Now, of course, I was not out there uh, during during my time in the Air Force. I'd never witnessed any of that stuff. But it's actually more from Bob's personal story when uh, he talks about what happened between uh, him and his wife and you know everything that he went through, uh, where he almost had his. Uh, uh, clearance revoked for a time because of all that where I went through something very similar with my ex-wife while I was at NSA it's just every detail he gave on that was like you know I went through the exact same th thing I know exactly what he's talking about I believe this guy based on something personal not anything technological so um, just commentary but go ahead Victoria oh yeah well if there's an S2 and an S4 is there an S6 8 10 does it go deeper or is for it no, to the best of my knowledge, when I was there, there was only four levels. Okay. It just goes down to four. S4 was a, the bottom level. And okay. you. And another thing he mentioned was the tunnel between the containment area, Area 51, to S4. Um, I think that's probably the only thing he didn't get entirely right. The tunnel didn't come into the complex at at uh, at, at uh, S4 level, it came in at S2 level. And then there was a different tunnel system from going from S2 at the, at the north end of the complex down to S4. And I don't know that he just maybe didn't explain it uh, thoroughly enough when, when he was talking about it, but, but that's the tunnel complex. And the tunnel complex wasn't entirely completed when I, uh, when I was there. They, they, I think they had, um, maybe a mile or two left to, to complete when I was there. How many years was it between you and Bob? Uh, probably two and a half. Okay. It's a little bit of time. Yeah, two and a half years. All right. A uh, good question here from uh, Lindsay Rutledge. Uh, she says, I've heard of crafts that were actually sentient. Did you ever hear of anything like that? Sentient? Sentient, so I guess uh, self-propelled crafts, self -propelled. Uh, not manned by ETs. Yeah, yeah, uh, drones. Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we did uh, recover a couple of those. They were uh, considered reconnaissance vehicles. They were smaller and they were um, remotely controlled, uh, similar to our drones, but they were they were remotely controlled. Yes, uh, there were. Some, I think um, uh, Linda Howe had somebody on that talked about it some, some years ago about one that was, was crashed. I, I believe it was in Washington State, uh, Western Washington State someplace. And it was a smaller, I think it was recovered and nobody knew what it was. And, and finally the Air Force from uh, uh, the, the local base in McCord, I believe it was McCord Air Force Base, or maybe it was Fairchild, but anyways, one of the bases went and picked it up and then they started looking at it and realizing it was something uh, extraordinary and they shipped it to uh, Area 51 and the scientists down there uh, figured out uh, there was a ET drone. Yes, so the, yeah, there were some. And maybe she was, maybe this uh, uh, person was talking about uh, that incident. Okay, okay. yeah, very. That's well the only done. one that I actually know of. Gotcha. Now, are there actually ETs at Area 51? Because you hear stories that, you know, maybe they have uh, some ones that they've, you know, captured and experimented on. You hear other stories of, no, there's actually a dialogue going on between humans and other ET races, and that's a place where they visit. So w what's going on with the, with the story of, you know, actual ETs that may be there at Area 51? Well, I used to always avoid this uh, conversation because... Uh, that there were, there are, there, there were some there. Yeah. There was a special complex, uh, the S2 annex, it was called, it was, uh, down towards Papoose. In fact, I think recently, just a few, uh, uh, days ago, somebody posted an aerial shot of this complex on YouTube or on, on the internet. And, um, 
it does show that's the area uh, that they had a, detain, a, a, a containment site for, uh, I don't know exactly the number of, uh, of, of entities that were there, uh, but they, they did have them there. They housed them there. And here's the problem they had was, again, remember, these were different races of ETs coming from different planets within the universe, and they all were um, different. They breathed different uh, gases. They had different needs. Uh, their environment had to be strictly controlled uh, in order for them to live. And um, so they, they didn't just show up and breathe our air and speak our language and, and adapt to our environment. They had, they had to have special environmental controls. And so they built this complex down there, very sophisticated complex. I had been there. I, I saw the complex. I don't know the number of, of entities that were there, and they called them entities back then, uh, but there were a, a, a good number of them. I, I would guess maybe somewhere between six and 10, uh, although I don't know for a fact that there were that many. Now, what I was involved with uh, was an a incident that I spoke about it. Um, the uh, UFO convention where one of these uh, entities escaped and uh, actually was, was caused the death of a, of a private citizen who was just driving uh, his vehicle with his family. Uh, it was a really horrible incident. And um, his wife was um, taken care of by the Air Force and um, she was uh, quietly uh, um, uh, she was quieted, I should say, by the Air Force, not threatened or anything like that. But she was paid money. And and um, ironically, her son, the, the, I think the extraordinary thing I talked about at UFO, UFO convention, uh, convention was her son, who was in the vehicle at the time, and this happened in the 80s. He later on, he later uh, entered the Air Force. He was actually stationed out at Area 51. Oh. And uh, oh, some years right. later... Some years later, uh, he was stationed there, and he knew what happened to his dad. I mean, he knew something happened. And he confronted an, a sergeant out there, his sergeant. Uh, he was a security policeman, or military police, Air Force, as Mike knows, they, they call him a security police. Uh, yes, right. But uh, he confronted the sergeant, and the sergeant admitted that, yeah, I was there at the time, and this creature had escaped it, it, and, it, and attacked, trying to get away. Uh, and but the creature was later killed by by security police, and um, I, I talk about that case. But there was a, was another case that had involved uh, a, a creature or an entity escaping. It was before I my time there, and that that entity was uh, killed by a, uh, um, a hunter. Uh, the hunter saw it, didn't know what it was. Uh, it was north of. Uh, uh, the test area up near uh, the Kawish uh, uh, Mountains, up near Warm Springs. And uh, he was hunting. He was actually a hunting guide. And he was with two other people guiding him. And when he saw this creature, this creature came at him. And so this guy, his name was Gus, shot and killed this thing. Now, what happened then was um, this particular entity uh, gave off an extremely toxic substance when the body decayed and it made everyone around them sick. Now the Air Force mm -hmm. knew that the Air Force had to come up. It was eventually reported to Nikon County Sheriff's Department, uh, Nevada Game and Fish. Eventually the Air Force got involved in it. The Air Force had to come up and uh, dispose of that, that, that entity's body and then uh, reclamate the land area around where this, uh, this thing died. And that, that was uh, in the early eighties. Are they all humanoid? Or do they, are they different? Or the ones you've seen? Well, well the ones I knew about, what, I, I wasn't briefed into, the, into that uh, for some time, uh, I think probably 85. I mean, I, I did some investigations involving this, but I wasn't ever really briefed into that until uh, about 85. Now, you might hear that there's 560 different races of ETs. Mm -hmm. Back then, there were only five. There were only five races that we knew about, at least the government 
that I read about and was briefed about. There were only five of them. Uh, one of one of them wasn't. Uh, one of them was um, uh, a humanoid, but it was he was a biologically. Uh, it was a biologically created. I mean the 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 uh, race of e ETs uh, built could I mean, they were so technologically more advanced than we are. They were able to manufacture uh, these these creatures, and some of them were not uh, human. Uh, some of them were more robotic than than human. Okay. I mean, then uh, they weren't human, but I mean, uh, they right. were. Uh, 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 Rather than having an even now, evens the one that we captured from the Roswell crash, uh, they actually created um, uh, robots too, uh, engineered, uh, biologically engineered uh, uh, entities. I think that's what they were, they were called that we called them. Okay, so it's not like they could mesh into society like Klaatu, you know, just put a nice coat and tie on, and you'd never notice. You would notice this guy, right? Well, <laughs> the the Nordics, the the last race that we knew, they were more humanoid than any of the other ones. I mean, you look at the Ebens, a small gray creature that you 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 couldn't you couldn't hide that 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 yeah. thing in a in a crowd. The <laughs> the one of the, the one of them was qual called the Trantaloid, which is like a praying mantis. You, I mean, that person that couldn't be out. But there was one particular race. Yeah, it was like Nordics. They were blonde, and okay. they're the ones that could hide in a crowd. Okay, I've heard of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have a couple questions here from the chat, and then I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Sure. Uh, this is from Christine Louvier. Have you seen any motherships, extreme, extremely large ship, uh, than smaller ships would come and go from? I personally have never seen one. Uh, I know that they, they track them on radar and satellites, uh, in uh, different orbits, uh, but but I personally never saw one. Okay, and then from Anne Celine, I'm curious with you having these connections and this knowledge, are are you ever visited due to your connection and knowledge by beings? No, <laughs> um, not that I know of. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I never had missing time. Um, I'm pretty strong willed. I. Um, I had some close encounters, so to speak, uh, in my official capacity. One I spoke about uh, on on my Gaia episodes. I, I have an episode, Cosmic Disclosure on Gaia. I talk about a case that we were investigating there at on uh, Nevada Test Range near, in, south of Tonopah Air Force Base in the Urania Mountain, where um, strange occurrences were happening. And myself and two other OSI agents, along with one security policeman, uh, were out searching this area, and we found a tunnel. And we followed, we walked into this tunnel, quite deep into this tunnel, tunnel, and um, suddenly we saw a lit area up ahead. And suddenly, this huge being—the uh, only thing I can connect it to—is uh, the day the Earth stood still, or uh, that that creature that comes out, although it wasn't quite that big, it came out into this tunnel and started moving towards us. Um, and we all had weapons. We, we carried weapons. We were federal agents, but we just had handguns. The security policeman that was somewhat distance behind us, he had an M16 and we stopped uh, and we immediately uh, took a defensive uh, stance and we didn't know what this was. And um, so I decided, and I was the uh, ranking person there, I decided that, you know, discretion is a better part of valor, that we, we need to just retreat out of there and then uh, notify uh, somebody else, uh, a larger a larger contingent of people, because I don't know what that was down there. And, I, and what intrigued me more was not necessarily this thing that was in, in, the, in the tunnel, uh, was what be, was behind it. There was a lit area behind there. There's it looked like a it looked like some sort of a factory behind there, and I knew there wasn't supposed to be anything there. So anyway, we retreated. Uh, we notified other uh, personnel. We notified the commander of Tonopah Air Force Base because he's the one that was telling us there was strange occurrences. Uh, later, a, a stronger force of uh, uh, of Air Force and some Army personnel went in there, 
and, and um, I wasn't there. Uh, and uh, eventually the area was destroyed uh, by us. And um, what they found, I, I was never privy to, uh, but uh, um, that was the only time uh, that I can remember that we that I actually came close to, to an encounter with one. But in my sleep or anything like that, no, I, I've never been visited. All right. At least that you're aware of. <laughs> I'm not aware of it. Right. Sure. right, right. So you, you did mention Gaia there. And uh, for anybody that's not familiar, you know, go to, go to Gaia, look up Richard Doty, and you'll find all kinds of information and segments with, uh, with Richard. Uh, a lot of fantastic information out there that he discusses. So I do want to switch it up a little bit and talk because we only got about 13 minutes left in the show. Um, I want to talk to you real briefly about the men in black because, um, you know, having spent some time at NSA and some of the stories that I've told from there where I've gone, you know, I had to go off site on occasion to locations hidden in plain sight and I'd have to dress in the black suit and tie. And so there's kind of a running joke amongst <laughs> our viewers that I was once a man in black, although I, I know I wasn't, but, um, to, to kind of clarify, okay, what, who exactly are the men in black and why do they seem to show up at a lot of these types of incidents? Well, the men in black, uh, I was not a man in, man in black. I, I was involved in that, but we did have, there was a particular, uh, office or, um, um, squad at Fort Belvoir, um, assigned to 76 or second year intelligence wings. Uh, and these men were the real men in black. They were, they, they were recruited into this particular program because of their, uh, unique skills. Uh, some of them were, uh, safe crackers. Some of them were, um, con artists. Some of them were, um, disguise artists. And when we couldn't do, when we couldn't complete a mission because, uh, the people just didn't believe us or we couldn't convince them. Uh, even with the disinformation, uh, we would turn it over to these uh, this other uh, squad of people, and, um, and and there weren't just men; there were women there too. And then they would go out, and they would use other tactics uh, that I wasn't involved with. And I didn't sanction any of those th tactics, but they would go out and scare them, scare the witnesses, or you know, break into their house and steal the photographs, or uh, somehow convince them that. Uh, what they saw uh, was not a, a, a UFO or maybe there wasn't a government craft, uh, whatever their mission was. Uh, but there was, in fact, a, 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 a group of people that uh, they didn't call themselves the men in black. They were the special access team, they call them. And uh, they I think they were formed back in the late 50s, uh, way before my time. But And I knew about them. I had actually worked with with them on an occasion uh, one one particular occasion i worked with them i didn't like their tactics uh they were strong armed um and i'm not you know I, i'm not that way unless i had to be and so i i didn't particularly like the way they operated and that was the only time i ever worked with them okay victoria looks like you want to ask something can you see it in my eyes or something yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay um i well, I don't want to say I got into an argument. I got into a heated discussion this week in social media, bad me, bad me, um, about how people are controlled by fear. And it's been going on since, you know, the dinosaurs. Um, do you think that media and pop culture and especially the films, um, especially from the 50s, who have depicted ETs and alien beings as horrible, soul sucking, I'm going to take over the world. Is that part of the fear? Uh, is it part of the disinformation to make us afraid of what's out there? One of the particular <clears throat> courses I took in counterintelligence uh, dealt with uh, conditioning the public. And uh, you do it in a number of ways. And, and the easiest way to condition the public is through film. Uh, and I, <laughs> I, I, didn't know, I didn't know it at the time, but I, I found out later in my OSI career that um, – from the 1950s, early 50s, uh, we, the United States government, uh, sanctioned movies about UFOs and about uh, uh, the dangers of ETs in order to condition the public. And one, one of the actual 
Uh, and I think uh, this has been out. I mean, Bill Moore talked about it because he, he dealt into the film industry. But um, one of the first films that the government fully sanctioned was The Day the Earth Stood Still that was made in, I believe, 1951. That was fully sanctioned by the United States government. But it was actually awesome. financed. But that's such a positive movie. He's like, you know, shape up or we're going to come back. I mean, I've that's one of my favorite movies of all times. Yeah, and and, and it uh, yeah, I think there was a couple messages that that the government wanted to to throw in there, and I think th I think they did. I think I think they were able that they were successful in it. Interesting. So let me ask you this, Rick, because you know I. I've had experiences, you've seen things, uh, you know, Victoria's had experiences. We have, you know, the disinformation that's out there. We have news reports. We have people that just make things up, um, you know, but then people legitimately have things going on. So how do we know what's real and, and what's not? That's a good question. And that's the way the government wants it. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> government throws so much into it. Uh, that they that you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Um, you know, there's UFO researchers out there that write will write a book that is uh, entirely uh, speculate speculation. Uh, they'll mix in a little uh, uh, fake stuff and and they they want you to believe what what they wrote is the truth. Um, the, the the Roswell case, for example, nobody got that right, and you know I came forth with with what I was briefed into. Uh, Stan Friedman came forth with with the same information. Others ha had come forth with it. Um, the The problem is not necessarily government. The problem is the UFO community. Phil Class made a speech at a UFO convention some years ago and told the UFO community, "You guys do more harm to yourself from within than I could ever do from outside." And that's the absolute truth. There's so much backstabbing within the UFO community. One person will write a book. Another person will write a book. It's contrary to what the first person wrote. And now there's a feud between the two. And bad, bad uh, uh, things happen. Um, uh, they try to destroy each other. And the, UFO, the, the government sits back and laughs at them. I mean, the, they're doing the government's work for them. They're disinforming the public. Uh, with these uh, fake books and 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 and, uh, and fake stories, so yeah. what do you believe? Um, number one, I'm not out here. Uh, I've never been out here uh, trying to disinform the public. I quit that in 1988. My security clearance ran out 2000. Uh, I'm trying to tell the public the truth, and and believe me, and some people don't. And there's other. I'm not the only one doing it. There's other former intelligence officers out there that are trying to do the same thing I'm doing. And I'm just trying to get the truth out there. And I just wish that the UFO community would, would, would portray the truth rather than uh, a book that, that they want sold for money. Yeah. And I think that's important uh, for, for people to realize is that you have, <laughs> you have not been a, uh, a counterintelligence agent since the 1980s. It's been, it's been a long time now. And that was essentially a, a job, right? That was a job. Yeah. Everything I did was sanctioned. I, I mean, if I hadn't, I mean, people will say to me, why, you know, how did you do this? Or why did you do it? Well, I was sanctioned. I was told to do that. I had a job to do. You go to work every day, you do your job. Your, your boss tells you what to do, you do it. Um, I had a unique job. I mean, I was told to do things that I don't necessarily agree with everything I did. I'm somewhat embarrassed by a lot of things I did during my career. If I had to do over again, I would probably have done it differently or might not have done it at all. Uh, I mean, I couldn't refuse, uh, but um, I might have found a different way to do it. And, um, and, and there's things that, uh, you know, I regret, uh, but uh, I did my job. And I, I, I did it well. I mean, I got I got plaques and 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 uh, and, and promotions for, for for what I did. Can I ask you a question about the UFO community, real quick? Um, I had heard someone mention that there might have been like Soviet agents at one time try to infiltrate the UFO community just to get, um, I guess, information. And that's one reason there was always so much disinformation put out. Is that true? Absolutely. Yep. You're, you, you, that, 
that it, that's exactly what happened. And Bill Moore, uh, when I recruited Bill Moore into the, uh, um, I recruited him as an asset. Uh, and that was because, because we knew that Bill had a friend who was uh, connected to a Soviet scientist. And that Soviet scientist was trying to get information out of the UFO community. And then we found there were a couple different cases uh, that the FBI ran uh, that uh, uh, involved uh, uh, assets that the that Russians recruited that had infiltrated. Uh, one one particular one was the um, uh, APRO. Uh, there were four uh, Soviet uh, um, assets found in, in APRO. So, yes, yeah, the Soviets did that. Do they have their own set of UFOs and reverse engineering that they're doing? That, to your knowledge? Yes, that's an entire diff entirely different show. Yes, yes, I can talk to I'm a night owl. We can keep going. <laughs> well, I would think I would think a lot of different countries do. I mean, UFOs don't just land in the United States. The Southwest is beautiful. Have you not been out there? I, I would, <laughs> if I was an alien, that's where I would go. I'd be heading towards like you know, Jerome or you know, Sedona. It's well, East, East <laughs> I know quickly East Germany. East Germany recovered, uh, the Soviet Union had recovered quite a few. China has, South Africa has, uh, Israel uh, found one in sitting in a desert uh, that they didn't know how long it had been there. So, yeah, there have been other countries. Okay. Can I and ask you I think Mike probably knows more about that than I do working for NSA. <laughs> yeah, well, Mike <laughs> you can't know. tell us everything that he did either. <laughs> I, okay. I can't, no. <laughs> Okay, can I ask you a really dumb question? I've been wanting to know since I was like nine. And sure. I'll be quiet. Okay, if we um, got technology through reverse engineering, how do we get the microwave? Who is that from? Because I love that species, whoever it is. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, the guy that, uh, Corso was the guy you should have asked that question, Phil Corso. Because that's changed everybody's life. I mean, for the better, I guess. Yes. Okay. Oh, well. I'll never know. <laughs> It's definitely great technology, but uh, it we, is. Are, <laughs> we are down here to the end of the show. Uh, we did have Anseline dropped in a $10 super sticker. So thank you very much. And for the two or the $10 super sticker, I absolutely appreciate that. So uh, Rick, we have about a minute left in the show here. Uh, how can people find you? I mentioned uh, Gaia earlier. Do they just watch your shows on Gaia or you have somewhere else they can go as well? Yeah, I have over 20 episodes on Cosmic Disclosure and Gaia, and I, I'm going up uh, this uh, uh, the end of this month and, and next month to make more shows, uh, ep oh, no, more episodes on, on Gaia. Um, my email, I, I answer every single email, even if it's uh, not really nice, but my email address is uh, Rick, R-I-C-K-D-O-T-Y-166 at msn.com. And... Uh, I'll, I try to answer. I get a lot of emails and I try to answer every single email. If you have a question, ask me and I'll, I used to have a website, but it was hacked to do two different times and yeah. it's just not worth it anymore um, to, to put one up there. But, but I answer the questions if you, if you, you'd like to s send me an email. Very good. You have any more conferences coming up here soon? Um, yeah, I'm going to Germany uh, in Ooh. February or in, um, I'm, I'm not, um, I believe it's uh, maybe January. No, it's January. It's gonna be. I'll be. I'll be in Wiesbaden, West Germany, or Wiesbaden, Germany, in in um, in January. Um, uh, I'll be on a panel discussion at Gaia in, in the middle of September uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Greer and some others. Oh, fantastic! Nice. All right, Rick. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Always fantastic uh, talking with you, and I hope to see you again here pretty soon. Mike, Victoria, thank you for having me. It's so been a nice pleasure. to meet you. Nice Have you a great too. evening. Thank you. All right, there we go. Rick Doty, uh, fantastic guy. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. meeting him at the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we sat and chatted for a while together, you know, a couple of old Air Force guys. Um, you know, there were some years between us there, but um, yeah, not really too much changed, I don't think, between those times. So 
it was uh yeah so uh, we became fast friends that was fantastic so he's really really nice he is he's a super nice guy i yeah. like rick <laughs> for sure i have more so, questions right, though. No. <laughs> oh yeah yeah no we'll definitely have to have him back uh for okay. sure yeah because we're just kind of skimming the surface i mean yeah he, he mentioned he has 20 different episodes out there on gaia right now and uh, i mean they're all different subjects it, it none of them are the same thing so you, you talk to rick about all kinds of different things so and then yeah here we have some of our uh uh chatters helen saying what a great guest he needs to come back soon yeah absolutely plus uh, your Android purity we need a second hour <laughs> that's all i'm saying um ooh, an after hours show no, anyway um plus your um your your uh, conferences are on release now right on dvd well From yeah the mega yeah, conference you can get the right the ufo mega conference presentations uh, you can get the dvds the presentations okay. on those yep absolutely so all right, let's go ahead and get to the shout out. So I want to thank Alina down in the chat room for moderating the chat. Um, Nicole was helping out as well since in Alina's area, there's all kinds of storms going on in Chicago oh, area. No. Yeah, you know, Tom, Tom McNicholas was having some issues uh, yes. earlier as well. Tornadoes yeah. last night. I think he was in direct mm -hmm. path. So, Yep. So mm -hmm. you guys be safe out there. Yeah, come to Texas. <laughs> I do want to. Thank our Super Chat superstars this evening. Uh, Guiding Echoes, that's Nicole, Android Purity, and Anne Celine. Thank you so much for being Super Chat superstars tonight. Always appreciated. Get to the Participants tab on uh, on YouTube here, which is never complete. Uh, we have Android Purity uh, and Celine. Thank you for joining us once again. April M. Wimigwans, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. There's Betty, uh, grand old folks, Betty Lange, appreciate it. D. Santi, thank you as well. There's Debbie O. A. Thank you as always. Uh, Helen Espinoza, thank you so very much. There's Lindsay Rutledge, thanks for the questions tonight. Pungai Fungi, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, there's Stacy Kamiski, thank you so much. Tammy Heitzman and TFT Tarot for today. Are the Olympics uh, over? I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I have not paid attention to the Olympics. No, she was watching the Olympics. So. <laughs> oh, she was watching the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm scrolling up here. So, uh, shadowy spectrums. Um, I guess I missed a question there. And um, let's see, this Hunter Road Media's Fairy Queen, Diane Hilbert. Yay! Thank you once again. UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Thanks for Ooh. joining us tonight. Kristen Louvier, thank you as well. Um, let's see. Andrew? I know. Oh, he's got the kids, baby. Uh, there was Adam <laughs> Tillery. Yeah. Yep. Adam's always lurking. Well, he's There's, kind of busy uh, these days, you know. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. N.A., thanks for joining us. Yeah. yeah there's uh, yeah. <laughs> Adam with the lurking eyes. So, all right, everybody. That will do it for this evening. So, for tomorrow, um, for Connecting the Universe, we're going to talk about similar type of uh, topics. We're just going to kind of carry the conversation over to uh, Connecting the Universe. That's tomorrow night, 8 p.m., uh, ConnectingTheUniversePortal.com. And then next week, we're going to get into uh, Ancient Symbolism, uh, oh, Connecting the Universe. Not that snake. <laughs> yes, we oh, no. will be. Yes. Not the we viper. We'll talking about the Orobos. <laughs> yes. Okay. Absolutely. It just means continuing. That's not uh, what it was meaning. <laughs> I don't I know what your your thing that you posted was. Uh, maybe it changed it up because it put that cosmic ring around it. I don't. I don't know. That was that was different. That's not the original symbol. Okay. So it, somebody somebody was being creative. So. It was ascending to a new level. Is what it was. Okay. <laughs> there was a lot of ascension. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, next week on Edge of the Rabbit Hole, we have uh, Trey Hudson, who is also there at the Laughlin UFO Mega Conference. Um, he's a paranormal investigator, but uh, he and his team out doing some investigations in the woods had some uh, some ET experiences. So uh, the area is called the Meadows. They basically call it the Skinwalker Ooh. Ranch of the South. So that'll be really interesting. Are there ever ghosts of ETs? Are there enough Why of them around? Why wouldn't there be? I don't know. I have a new. I have a new thing to look into now. <laughs> Et ghost. 
You know, this is this is cool. April says, you know, Mike, you're the only person to ever pronounce my last name right. <laughs> Yo, know, Jill Nemchinsky told me the same thing. Jill was in earlier, but she didn't show up in the list. So, I mean, I don't know. I, it's a I'm, gift. I'm a writer. I don't, uh... <laughs> I don't pronounce everything correctly. That is for sure. So I, I just got lucky. It's a gift. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is... Um, I, th I think technically it was last week, but we forgot to mention it. Victoria, you've oh. been my co-hostess here on Edge of the Rabbit Hole for a year. Do I get to stay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes, you are now officially the, the co-hostess after a whole year. Oh, thank you. So the, your, your yep. internship is over. <laughs> Do I have to get the secret tattoo? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you have to get the tattoo. Okay, the little rabbit, or I'll put the rabbit over here. Right, the little rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it's been a year. I mean, I know it's gone by quick. Yeah, it really has. My, except for a few weeks, but you know, it's wow. Right? I yeah, learned, we take a yeah. little bit of a break during December, the and then we had a couple. Yeah. yeah, we had a couple weeks off there in June. Yeah, so. but this has been amazing. Thank you. I have learned. You're welcome. Okay, I've learned a thing or two. No, I have learned so much. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, now what are we talking about? <laughs> you know. So I have to catch up, but this has been amazing. I, I have learned so much and I, I appreciate it so much. And you changed well, my you life for, for being... the better. <laughs> you really have now. My daughter may not agree, but you know. <laughs> okay. Well, no, but you I, no, I appreciate you, do, you being a fantastic co-host. You ask some amazing questions. The guests love you. The, the <laughs> mad hatters down there, our, our chatters love you. So minus the microwave Thank question, you. but I've always wondered that, you know, where did the microwave come from? I think it's the Pleiadians because they're cool. The Pleiadians. Yeah. yeah. Could be. They need their baked potatoes. Okay. They do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, you have a great night. Join us tomorrow, connectuniverseportal.com. And uh, of course, next week, right back here. So, oh, and for those of you that didn't, <laughs> that haven't checked it out yet, there is the new uh, Ancient Secrets of Egypt. So basically, that's all the Egypt stuff that I posted inside the Connected Universe member site. I pulled it out and just made it its own thing. So if you're still oh. hesitant about the whole monthly membership thing, which you have 30-day free trial, come check it out anyway. Um, if, if you're still hesitant about the whole monthly membership thing, 1995, you get everything that was there re regarding Egypt. Uh, the whole travel blog, you get the classes, you get the Q and A videos. It's like nine and it's over nine wow. hours worth of footage. And I'm still adding to it as we continue to cover different topics on Egypt. I'll add those things in there. So you're going to end up with hours and hours and hours worth of information on ancient secrets of Egypt. So That's let's go to cool. connect universe portal.com and pick up on that. Can they download a diploma at the end? I can make you one real quick. You know, that's an <laughs> option. But to me, that's always so goofy because th it, there's nothing accredited whatsoever about any of that. You so. said goofy. That's my middle name. So, okay. <laughs> I'll make you one. So, and there's uh, Alina. Victoria always does her research. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. It just looks lovely. <laughs> yes, Auntie. Yay. Happy anniversary. Oh, thank you. Congratulations, Victoria. Yeah, congrats congrats Aww. victoria i'm not gonna make you cry uh, stop <laughs> <laughs> just call me or message me on you know everyone else does yeah <laughs> there you go everybody have a great night we'll see you tomorrow and we'll see you right back here next week have a great night if i could get the little video there it is <laughs> have a good night <laughs>